So welcome to Eco Ask Why. Today we have an idea episode and we'll be talking about how procurement serves during continuous disruption. And I brought in an expert, Michael Van Kulen, who's the who's chief procurement officer at Coupa Software. So how are you doing today, Michael? Yeah, doing very well. Doing very well. Thanks for having me. Oh, I'm very excited to have you, sir. Thank you so much. And I mean, for, for our listeners out there, paint that picture of how procurement has evolved you know, due to the pandemic and that led to a world of continu- continuous disruption that we live in. Yeah, I, I think this has been a, a development that we've seen over the past, you know, I'd say five to ten years. I, I've been I've been doing this for a, for a little while. Uh, have some gray hairs uh, to to prove it, um, but I think procurement over the last decade has slowly but steadily uh, been able to to through transformative change really become more strategic uh, when it comes to spend spend visibility. Uh, what do we know about our suppliers? How do we ensure uh, that we have a competitive uh, spend base? And so that has mm-hmm. been a, a, a development that we've seen over the past decade. I think what COVID did and the pandemic, uh, and it was just one element of, of supply chain disruption, is it really took procurement to the next level. Uh, I think executives and leadership teams and CEOs and, and, and the executive teams have realized that they didn't really know a whole lot about their suppliers. Uh, they didn't really know a whole lot about contingencies and, and backup plans and uh, how, rely, how, how reliant they are on, on their suppliers to ensure business continuity. Um, and I think that procurement has really taken this as an opportunity to catapult ourselves into the boardroom in a very short period of time. I think it was a development that already was, uh, was happening before uh, the, the pandemic. And, and there's been other disruptions over the past two years. I mean, I think a lot of people focus on the, the pandemic and COVID as the root cause. I think it was one element. Uh, we've seen some some ramifications downstream in the supply chain, but we've seen other disruptive events like climate change, uh, of course, legislation and things of that nature that really made procurement so much more important to companies across the globe. And it has really allowed us to, to like I said, catapult ourselves from what we always say from the basement into the boardroom. Right, right. Basement to the boardroom. I love that. I mean, it, it kind of sounds like the pandemic really was just a launching point, but it had been building up to that point anyway. So. When things start normalizing in the future, Michael, how can procurement really remain strategically important you know, in the future? Yeah, I, I think it's a great question. And it's something that, that we talk about a lot within the profession. And, and, you know, when I talk to my fellow procurement leaders and procurement friends out there in, in, across the globe is, to your point, is how do we not go back to where we were uh, and become that tactical right. uh, function again? And how do we remain relevant? Uh, I, I think the key is 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 one clearly articulating to our chief executive officer who historically would spend 1% of their time with suppliers, right? Just think about it, right? If you talk about the mm-hmm. CEO and, and mm-hmm. what they would do on a day-to-day basis, they would only spend 1% of their time with suppliers. And I think that that is a call to action for us in procurement uh, to ensure that the CEO does value the suppliers as an extension uh, of their own companies. Uh, and in order for us to do that, we need to ensure that we provide strategic uh, and competitive advantages uh, to our CEO and, and 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 that respective leadership team. And how do we do that? Well, we can do that in a whole plethora of different ways. Uh, one way would be, you know, focusing on on ESG and environmental and, and social governance, and super important in any company. Your shareholders are asking for it. Your suppliers are asking for it. Your customers, your 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 employees. Um, so be, become that 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 enabler. Uh, of of something as strategic as ESG diversity super important we we talk about it a lot procurement is uniquely qualified and positioned to 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 steer our companies into that right direction but we can also think about things like risk and mitigation of risk uh become a competitive edge when it comes to driving innovation through your supply chain i mean that is level 4 procurement uh your supply chain is the biggest innovation hub you have uh and i believe that if procurement is able to in an elevator pitch type of way, uh, position for procurement as a as a competitive edge and a competitive weapon and and a strategic enabler, we will be relevant uh, in in the future. And and I've said several times on on, on different occasions that I believe that the chief procurement officer uh, will be in in the uh, in the CEO succession plans going forward. Okay, 
I, I definitely want to unpack two areas that you talked about there. Let's just start with the very first one around innovation because you you got you caught my attention big time with that one. So what does that actually look like? Let's get tactical from sure. a procurement standpoint. If yeah. we got a procurement professional that's listening to this episode right now, and you say, "Look, I need to be innovative." What are they actually doing? Yeah. So so just think about like if you have the right relationships, and we've talked about relationships and the importance of relationships with your suppliers during this pandemic, right? If you did not have the right relationships with your suppliers and you didn't have the right level of visibility in what was going on with your suppliers as a result of the disruption in supply chain, you very quickly uh, got into trouble, right? Like you right. all of a sudden realized that maybe the supplier of your supplier's supplier uh, had a significant reliance on a certain country that would go in lockdown, for example, China. Right. Um, right. And if you didn't have that level of visibility with your suppliers, then you, you, you would kind of lose that, that visibility in terms of, hey, what do I do? What are my fallback plans? And how can I find optionality in my supply chain? Um, so that's one element of it is just purely business continuity. But if you have the right relationships with your suppliers, and I've seen this firsthand in, in my career so far, um, if you have that right partnership and collaboration and you are more transparent in where do I want to go as a company, and where's my supplier going? And how can we together potentially uh, drive some mutually beneficial outcomes? Um, that's what innovation is, right? Suppliers will bring innovation to their customers if there is the right level of transparency and the right level of relationship. And that gives me an opportunity to drive competitive edge. And I, you know, I was at Lululemon uh, before I came to Coupa, uh, and we, we had the ability to drive very innovative things in our packaging, for example. Um, right. And the only reason why a supplier was bringing us innovation is because we had the right level of relationship to begin with. And, uh, and that's what innovation to me means is it means suppliers are willing to open up uh, their, their, their doors and their, you know, hey, here's what we're thinking about over the next three to five years. If I do the same thing on, on, on my end, right. then you can drive uh, lots of innovation in your supply chain. Uh, and, and that's what that really means to me. Yeah, I mean, it's very reciprocal, right? I mean, but you have to be willing to open it up on your end and then the suppliers at the same time, you're building that trust, you're building that relationship and that it, everybody's, all, everybody, all the, the ties are rising the ships right together. So that's Absolutely. what it's all about. The other area that, that you really caught my interest in was that 1% statistic around the CEOs and time that they're spending with the suppliers. So is there a goal with this? If 1% is where they're at now, are, what is we're trying to get him a five percent ten? Is there a number you're trying to get a CEO to, or just what, what are we chasing I, I, here? I, yeah, I mean that that's a tricky one to answer. But you know, if I'm the chief executive officer of any company today, and I still have only one percent of my time dedicated to to talking to my suppliers, I, I just honestly think that that you're missing a huge opportunity. Uh, right. Because, like I said, I mean, it can drive innovation and it it, it allows you to achieve your strategic objectives and. But I, I, I flipped it around recently in a conversation and I said, look, it's almost like a, a like a scorecard or a report card for procurement. Because, I mean, yeah. the flip side of that is that we, procurement, have done, you know, let's say a mediocre job at best at explaining and articulating to the chief executive officer why it is important to have much more relevant wow. and, and, and frequent co connections with your suppliers. Right. I mean, the CEO, right. of course, they often have the attention span. Um, you know, which is similar to my five-year-old. I don't mean this disrespectfully. They have, of course, uh, you know, they're running a company. They're responsible for thousands of employees or hundreds or whatever the size. It doesn't really matter. They got shareholders. Uh, they got investors. They got expectations. Right. They got, you know, they, they want to grow the business. And so I understand. Yeah, they have a very full agenda. Uh, and, and, and in order for, for, for procurement to, to explain to that CEO, hey, you need to spend more time in your supply chain. I need to make it relevant for him or her, right? I need to right. explain why I think it's in his or her best interest to spend more time with suppliers. Um, so right. I kind of flipped it around and said, rather than you know pointing the finger at the CEO and say, well, why are you not spending more time with your suppliers? We could also flip it around and say, we procurement should step up. We should, you know, we should lead, if you will. And we should right. explain to our CEO, you need to spend more time with your suppliers because of these, you know, five, six, seven, eight different things. And I, I call it like the elevator pitch of procurement, like the 30 seconds elevator pitch of procurement. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, you, 
you're all over right there. And I, I'm curious from your standpoint as well. You work with a lot, your world of procurement. You, you, you have a passion for this. For people like, like Eco and when we're thinking about technology in the future and how we can better serve procurement from that procurement's point of view, there are, just, there are things like punch out and things like that that are out there. But what does that technology enable actually entail for us to be able to serve procurement at a higher level? Yeah. Um, you know, the way that I've always looked at, at technology, even before I joined the company I currently work for, um, I always right. looked at it and said, look, if, if I am, if I want to drive best in class outcomes, if I want to have a best in class procurement function, I need to look at it through the lens of people, process and technology. It always comes down to those three elements. Okay. I legitimately believe that without the right people or the right process or the right technology, you will never, uh, sustainably achieve best in class procurement outcomes. And in other words, right. you could have the best people in the world running your procurement function, but if you have not operationalized yourself appropriately in terms of when do I get involved, uh, do I have that seat at the table, as we've always said for you know for a very long period of time, then I, I will always drive suboptimal outcomes. But if I am stuck in procure to pay and I'm not in source to contract and managing the spend through the power of technology, I will also always drive suboptimal outcomes. So the way that I looked at technology mm -hmm. in, in my career so far is I've always looked at it as an enabler and it should allow me to focus time and energy on those areas in procurement that drive more value. It's not about cost saving. You know, the other thing I maybe want to, maybe I'm, I'm going on a slight tangent here, but I've always looked at procurement as not cost saving. I've always looked at procurement as driving more value out of the spend. Um, and that can be okay. cost reduction, but it could also be uh, risk mitigation, better quality, better lead time, payment terms, cash flow optimization. And so my point with technology here is technology should enable me to focus on those areas of the procurement journey, not just purchasing, because a lot of people think that procurement is purchasing. It's very different um, to focus on those elements in the procurement journey that allow me to drive more value and focus on things that I can add value rather than being stuck in, you know, direct to PO and PO to invoice that what we call the downstream procurement right. that should be driven by technology. And that allows me to shift my time and energy on things that drive value source to contract risk mitigation, uh, environmental, social governance, um, you know, things of that nature. Right now for, all right. Does so that makes sense. It does make sense. I'm just curious here. So for a distributor like Eco, so we're, we're, we're the supplier serving the procurement world, right? We, we're, we're calling on that. How should we respond with the technology to, to, to not just be that, down, to, to your point, that downstream, but get in more of that upstream type conversations and help? I mean, do, is it just you have to have a certain level of investment in technology just to play the game? And then from there, you know, what does that look like moving forward to be on that upstream conversations and to bring value there? Yeah, I, I, I think that, um, you know, um, uh, technology should always be very easy to use. Uh, so user friendliness is very important, not just for internal users, but also for suppliers. Um, so adoption levels are, are critical, right? I mean, it's kind of simple okay. that if you, know, if you buy a car and nobody knows how to drive it or nobody wants to drive it because it kind of doesn't really drive very well then you got a car that's stuck on the parking lot and you're just not using it. The same applies to technology, right? right? It feels very logical, but I think for a very long period of time, uh, we've more focused on getting some piece of technology in your four walls rather than focusing on the business challenges that you have and ensure that you bring technology that drives adoption, uh, is easy to use, people want to use, uh, and, and reduces the friction between internal and external so in other words, your internal users and your supplier community, uh, and that really break down those barriers and those silos. And I think that that's what technology right. is supposed to do, right? Technology is supposed to make things simpler uh, and easier and, and, and drive adoption and, and usability rather than it becoming either a contained within your own four walls and you don't really care about your supplier community, which is often what ERPs have done for, for us, right? I mean, we, we were kind of prisoners, right? When I've deployed SAP, I've deployed Oracle. And you kind of become a prisoner almost of your own environment. And it's very right. difficult to, to communicate externally. So it's a bit of a long answer. But my point here is it's important that we focus on the usability both internally and externally because that drives adoption. And with right. adoption, 
now you start to extract more value out of the relationship. So that's what I would say to you guys as well is, yes, technology is an important enabler, but as the selection, you know, I select that technology, I need to make sure it enables that relationship in a very seamless and frictionless way. Right. Now, I'm also curious, I'm going to back up one more area that you touched on, because you touched on it two or three times I know of around risk mitigation. And okay, so for a supplier that's serving procurement, we're calling, we're trying to, to to help you in that in that area. What does that specific specifically look like from a risk mitigation standpoint? Yeah, I, I think as suppliers, what I always call on to my suppliers that matter to me. You know, I have suppliers that okay, you know, the supplier uh, has a challenge within their supply chain. I maybe don't really care a whole lot. Like for example, you know, if it's office supplies, it doesn't really matter. But if I've if I've properly segmented my suppliers, and I've segmented my suppliers in terms of you know uh, importance, you know how important are these suppliers to my business? Then what I always encourage suppliers to do is open up to me, tell me exactly what's right. going on in your supply chain, explain to me where you get your stuff from. Um, let's let's go around right. transparency exactly. And, and, and that comes back to what I said earlier. The only way that suppliers are willing to do that, if they realize that I'm not there to nickel and dime you. You know, I've never done, and you know, I know I'm on the record here. Um, you know, I've never focused just on cost. Um, you know, again, cost is one element of what procurement brings to the table. Of course, I'm accountable for ensuring I've got a competitive spend base, obviously. Um, but it's so much more than that. And the only way that suppliers, I always encourage suppliers, including your company, Open up your 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 four door your 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 walls. Right, open up your door. Show me right. how I can be more efficient for you. Maybe it is giving you better rolling forecast. Maybe it is giving you a better idea of where I'm growing, which parts of the world, which geographical regions am I growing? Because it might be relevant for you. Right. And so my point here is, it's about full transparency. It's about opening up uh, more than maybe historically we did. Um, maybe even giving away some of your, you know, competitive edges. Uh, yeah. And so that that's a little sensitive, right? I'm not saying give away your crown jewels, but at least I'm saying open up more so I understand what behaviors I have that I could potentially change. And now we're actually going to extract more value out of the relationship. So transparency for me has always been the key. Right. And I think just from a, from a distributor standpoint, one thing I thought think about through the years for me, I was a little more hesitant to just be that forthcoming with some of those areas that I could serve, like the, to, to help in that risk mitigation standpoint, because I wanted to be the hero, you know, yeah. and, 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 in, and in many ways, like we got to stop that. Look, we just need to be transparent. And, and if we just keep serving and we give you in procurement, all these different areas to consider, you know, if we're bringing that right level of value and relate, like you said, or you've been saying the whole relationship, the whole time about the power of relationship, if we're focused on that, Man, you know, good things will happen. Magic, magic happens in a relationship like that. Uh, I, I think it goes for any relationship. Yeah, I mean, maybe it's a little broader than just the business relationship, but just yeah. in, in the world, right? Uh, is uh, if we are a little more open with our expectations, the pain points, uh, some behavioral change that we could potentially together influence. And I, I just think that those are the things that I, I think will continue to extract more value out of a relationship, whether that's in business or in, I'm not here to give you any lessons on, on your personal situations, but um, you know, the more transparent we are, the better the outcomes typically become. It's just, Absolutely. there's not, that, that was not rocket science, but I sat there, but. Yeah, no, no doubt. No doubt. Well, Michael, let's transition a little bit in our conversation. I we, we, we typically call this our hero section. So let, let our listeners know, about you let's 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 find out a little about you about you behind the scenes if you will so just tell me about your journey to where you're at right now yeah i, I can i can do that real quick um you know i started off in accounting my background is finance so after i graduated okay. i was i was 21 uh, when i graduated in amsterdam uh, i started off in accounting i worked for arthur anderson uh for a couple of years i'm uh, i'm an aa alumni and i'm proud to to be one um but i also realized well, very quickly that consulting wasn't maybe my 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 journey uh, went into finance, did a couple finance gigs, set up a shared service center for finance for a company called Nuance uh, that got bought recently by Microsoft. Uh, but I was, I mean, this is years ago. Um, did a lot of finance stuff. And then at Foot Locker, 
when I was the European controller, um, I got first um, introduced to the art of procurement and strategic sourcing. So this is still a while ago. It's like 15 years ago or so uh, where we implemented e-sourcing. Um, this was when free markets got bought by Ariba. Uh, and the CFO at the time said, hey, Michael, are you interested in doing that? And I said, well, that sounds something that I'm not super sure I know how to do. Uh, and that goes back into my career often where I, I've taken on things that I wasn't sure if I was qualified to do, including, you know, taking on the role here at Coupa. Um, but I, anyway, that comes back in my career several times. And and I took it on and I loved it. And I, I realized that with my finance brain, the logical side of, of the brain um, and, and driving better yeah. business outcomes was something that really, really, uh, you know, got me excited and passionate about, you know, strategic sourcing, we called it at the time. Um, and then from Foot Locker, I went to a company called VF Corp. Uh, VF is the parent for North Face and Vans and Timberland and a bunch of other brands. And uh, and that's really where, uh, you know, I took my career to the next level together with a lot of support that I've had from from really great leaders at VF. It's a great company. And um, and I was asked to do a set up the procurement function in Europe, uh, which we did. I was very successful. Then I was uh, given an opportunity uh, uh, to lead global transformation at VF. I moved my family to the U.S., which was a childhood dream of mine to to go to corporate America. So I've done that. Uh, for a few years, and and uh, we led global transformation there again with with a fabulous team, uh, and then was asked to to do the same at Lululemon, and so we transformed procurement there. Uh, moved to Vancouver, so I lived in Belgium. I've lived in Holland. I then moved to the U.S. I moved to Canada with the family, and so my poor wife and kids, and um, and we lived in Vancouver for eight years, and and did the same thing at Lulu, and then an opportunity came to uh, get to join the mothership almost because I I'm a three time Coupa customer. That's the last time I'll. I'll, I'll position Coupa on this call, but um, and yeah, and that got me to this role, and and now I, I, you know, I get to work for, you know, the global leader in business spend management, and um, yeah, and I, I love procurement, and where better to do that than uh, that than a company that that has known and has really helped transform procurement uh, across the globe, and so I, I consider myself extremely lucky to be here, uh, and and fortunate to evangelize uh, the profession that I've been passionate about for over a decade now so um yeah that's a that's a journey in a in a in a, in a short version well I, I love the journey i had so many that was very very interesting so where is home now for you michael where, where are you guys yeah, located I, now? I, I recently moved back to europe um okay. so I, I reside in holland uh which is my home country i hadn't been there for 10 years and so in the longer 15 years uh okay. and so COVID realized that we can work anywhere uh, and I, I, we wanted to be close to the family and, and my parents and family and friends, et cetera. And so we moved back to Europe. But uh, yeah, I, 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 I love what I do. I, I again, I, I consider myself uh, extremely fortunate to represent, uh, you know, 3,500 uh, plus employees or colleagues of mine, Coupanians. And uh, yeah, it's, it's a fabulous time to be in procurement. This is, it's, the best, it's the best time to be in procurement today. Uh, and uh, yeah. there's never been a better time to be in procurement. Well, I'm, I'm curious on that. You know, you, what are you seeing some of the, the biggest challenges out there that procurement has in the future and that you guys are, are addressing directly? What, what would they be? Yeah, it, I, I think, you know, of course, if you look at, look at the economic uh, outlook, uh, I, I think, you know, we all read the papers and we know that probably the next 12, 18 months are going to be challenging. We don't know how long. We don't right. know where it's going. Inflation, interest rates, uh, you know, there's lots of disruption. You can now see that. Some of these really large organizations are starting to shrink their uh, their employee base. So that, of course, is going to have some ramifications downstream. The holiday season is upon us. Uh, retailers are very, very nervous across the globe uh, in terms of spending. Uh, inventory levels are, are extremely high. Um, so there's uh, to, to sum it up, it, there is a lot of stuff for procurement to, to get nervous about. Um, but here I also, you know, I'm a glass half full kind of person. I'm, I'm, I always like to be positive. And I say, you know, if you look historically, companies that were able to make the right investments during times of high disruption and potentially, uh, you know, the, the recession or whatever we, we, we call what's coming up, um, the companies that make the right investments are the ones that are going to thrive. That has historically been proven. There's lots of great studies out there. McKinsey has done some really good research around that, for example, where you see that companies that made the right investments significantly outperformed companies that didn't. Uh, because you can do three things in times of stress and 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 and, and uncertainty. You can flight, fight or freeze. 
right. uh, and and you know I highly encourage your listeners uh, to not run for the hills, you know, not go like oh you know we don't know what's going to happen and I'm just going to sit back and and see it you know see the train coming. Uh, no, let's think about like where do we invest? Do we need uh, to have better operationalization of the procurement process? Do we need to invest in technology? Mm. Do we need to invest in people? How do we arm ourselves to be ready for whatever comes next? Because we nobody knows, right? There's midterm elections. Right. I, I was reading the news this morning. I don't know. We I don't think anybody really knows what's going on yet uh, with Congress and the Senate, and that's really important for for this part of the world. But in Europe, we've got, of course, the, the horrible. Uh, situation there in the Ukraine. Uh, we've got the winter coming and nobody knows when that's over. And of course, we all hope it was done yesterday and it should not, have, you know, like, but, but my, so my point is right. there's still a lot of crazy disruption out there. We don't really know what the future brings. But what I think for us in procurement is that should not give us anxiety. It should give us opportunity um, to make the right investments mm. in, into, into our infrastructure and make sure we're ready for whatever comes next. Right. Right. Well, thank you so much for, for really unpacking that. Because I mean, that, there were really uh, good salient points around true risk and areas to consider moving forward. And so maybe somebody's listening, Michael, and they, they heard your journey. They, they heard about all the wonderful things you're doing in the procurement. Give them some advice if they want to pursue that career in procurement. You know, what, what would you tell them if they're just getting started? One, congratulations. Because you've picked a fabulous profession and uh, well done. So congrats. Because there's no procurement school yet. Yeah. I think that if there's one thing that, and this is a sidestep here real quick, but if there's one thing that we should figure out is how do we at all these fabulous schools all across the globe uh, start to get people excited and passionate about procurement? Because it is a fabulous profession. You're at the heart and the center of the universe. Uh, you drive innovation, you drive strategic objectives, you drive value, competitive edge. Do you risk your supply chain, environmental? You're actually here to, you know, we can actually drive real meaningful change in terms of climate. Uh, you know, I mean, we are at the epicenter of, of all of that. So one, congratulations for picking a profession that, uh, that I think is the best in the world. And I really believe that. And I never want to do anything but procurement on the record here. Um, but what I would say is don't be afraid. Uh, procurement is not easy. It, it can be very, very challenging. Uh, don't be afraid, and I've, I've said this before a few times, but don't be afraid to get scars. Uh, don't be afraid to okay. disrupt. Don't be afraid to step up and lead and challenge the status quo. Uh, scars create character. I have a few. I'm happy to share them uh, with any one of your listeners if they ever want to know. Um, but it is, you know, it is our responsibility to uh, not disrupt for the sake of disrupting, because that's that that is meaningless. But there are in any company in the world today, I guarantee you that I could come in and with me, lots of other great, fabulous, visionary procurement leaders to come in and drive real meaningful change. And the reason why we do it is because we can drive more value. So my, my encouragement to your listeners is one, again, congratulations. I know it's a longer answer, but so forgive me. Congratulations. No. Don't be afraid. Step up and lead. Disrupt where you need to. And don't be afraid to get some scars along the way. I, okay. I think that those are probably my, 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 my top things. What about the one that may be listening right now and may say, you know what, I don't want to go to procurement because that's all they do is just cut POs all day. What would you, what would you tell that, say to that person? Well, that's a great opportunity for you to stop doing it. I mean, that's not procurement. Cutting POs, that is level one procurement. Right. Uh, and, and that's not uh, judgment. That's not a, a, you know, I'm not saying that's mediocre, uh, but that is level one procurement. If you're in, if your company, if you're listening to this and you are spending 85 or 90% of your time in the downstream process, then it means that either you need to change the way you've operationalized procurement, but you very likely are stuck in an ERP. Uh, you're stuck in some old legacy uh, technology landscape. And it's a great opportunity for you to drive significant value in your company. So it's a perfect time. I would love to come in. I, I don't want to come into a company where it's all been done. Right. If I really want to drive right. a career and if I want to make some some really great career moves, then I want to come into a company where either they have no procurement or it's level one procurement, because the value that you can create right. in an organization like that is significant. Um, and it's exciting. You know, it's exciting that it's it's an exciting journey. I've done it a few times and I'm happy to share more detail. But uh, it's it's the it's the best time to be in procurement. If your organization is down in, in, in procure to pay land. Um, 
it's a perfect time to go into procurement and yeah. extract some meaningful value. I mean, would you mind unpacking just a little bit on that? Because we, we have a, we serve a lot of manufacturers, and and I'm sure some of them are at that level one. So, just a couple of steps that you would recommend taking. Well, I think the first thing you want to do is run a real deep analytics of your spend. Right. I mean, there's no way that you can determine and 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 claim value proposition if you don't know what your baseline is. And I'm still amazed when I talk to practitioners. Uh, I run into them at conferences, or I, or I have some Zoom calls here and there with with fellow leaders. And I ask very simple questions. What is your total spend? What is your total addressable spend? How much of that spend you have on the contract? What is your rec to PO cycle time? How much of that is electronically invoiced? Do you have a no PO, no pay policy? Very basic. That's basic stuff. Yeah, for me, that's still level one, level 1. 1.5 right. procurement on a, four, on a one to four scale. Right. And I'm often amazed that the answer is, oh, I don't really know. Or, oh, I need to... I think it's kind of this, but it could be, I'm like, no, if you don't know that, if you don't know your checkbook, if I don't know 80% of the spend with 20% of my suppliers, if I don't know who I spent my dollars with and, and what my contractual obligations are and, and what the start and end date of my contracts are is, and if I don't know any of that basic stuff, then how on earth can I ever expect my company to think of me as a strategic advantage? Right. So, so my, my point here is, um, I'm still amazed. So that's that's step one. Step one is checkbook. Right. Then you're going to start to look at the checkbook and see with what suppliers you spend the most amount of money with. And then you're going to, of course, hone in on that. Um, and you're going to run some strategic sourcing events to extract some value. That is still, that is level two procurement. That is not level four. That is level two procurement. And then you start to manage that contract with that supplier. Uh, because now I have a contract. It's like marriage. Once you get married, you start to actually, you know, kind of commit to what you said. Is at least right. what my wife always tells me. And That's you right. know, and so now you start to manage that relationship together. And what we just said, relationship management, category strategies, demand management, and and things of that nature. Now you're starting to become level three procurement, right? You start to manage the relationship with your supplier, manage the contract from start to end. Uh, you start to write category plans, you understand cost drivers, you understand the market dynamics, you understand the competitive uh, situation of whatever it is that you're buying, whether you buy widgets or consulting, or it doesn't matter what you buy, logistics or shopping bags or what uh, hangers, it doesn't matter. And now you, so that's level three procurement. And then ultimately you want to be level four. Level four procurement is supply chain excellence. It is driving option optionality. It's digital twin of your supply chain. Um, it is drive innovation in your supply chain. So that's like getting you from level one to level four. It's going to take you three to four years. Yeah. This is not six months. It's not a sprint. Right. It's not, like, let me quickly get to the finish line. No, it's a journey and it's a constant journey because new people come into your company. People leave, people come and go. They bring in their own business practices from wherever they were working. And they're like, well, at my old company, I never had to go to procurement. I could make my own decisions. I'm like, well, that's great. That was your old company. There needs to be segregation of duties, right? If you're a budget right. owner, you should never be running a strategic sourcing event because there's a conflict of interest, right? I mean, if I'm the budget owner and I make the award decision, somebody in between needs to at least make sure that we drive the right competitive process and we've ev evaluated and we provide optionality to our leadership teams and our stakeholders. And But then procurement does not have the D of decision. It's very important. Right. A lot of business right. leaders are like, I don't right. want to work with procurement, but all you guys care about is the lowest cost. I'm like, yeah, that's maybe the procurement team you were working with in your old company. That, but that's not procurement. Procurement is not get the cheapest and the most cheerful solution. Procurement is how do I drive the best outcomes that are supporting our strategic objectives and optimize the value of my spend? I, I mean, to me, that's what procurement is. And right. so, I'm, I'm, again, it's a bit of a long answer, but my point is. That's how we need to position procurement. If we position procurement like a, a value enabler and a, you know, I've, I've told marketeers, how would you like me to give you 20% more budget? Absolutely. Because marketeers are infamous to say, I don't want to work <laughs> with procurement because you're going to cut my spend and then next year I won't get the same budget. Like, no, no, right, that's not the right. point. It might be one point, but we can also potentially uh, extract more value and give you more budget. Right. right. I mean, it's a very different approach. And uh, But I would say procurement should not have the D of decision. 
but we certainly own the strategic process. Right. Exactly. Well, man, thank you so much for unpacking that. I, I'm curious. You're such a passionate guy. When do you get your fulfillment out of your work? Like what brings you the most joy in, in what you do day in and day out? Um, well, I've always, and I hope that, you know, those that have ever reported to me or I've supported, I should say, uh, yeah. would, uh, would, would, uh, validate this. But, uh, my number one at, at Coupa and at all of my prior, 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 prior companies has always been my team. Um, you know, I, I strongly believe that I am here and it's not popularity contest by any means, uh, that my team is the number one priority. Uh, supporting my team, developing them, giving them exposure, uh, supporting them, and 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 also demonstrating that right. It's okay to make mistakes. Right. We say at Coupa, fail fast, move on. Uh, you know, like so that has always. And what gives me the biggest satisfaction is to see people that I've supported uh, during my uh, tenure, if you will, uh, professionally. Uh, that they take on bigger challenges, uh, bigger roles, uh, that they're successful. Right. Uh, that they're thriving. Uh, nothing gives me greater satisfaction than that on the professional front. Um, so that's one element. Uh, the second element is like in, in my day job today is I get to evangelize a profession that I've loved for a long time. And right. so that gives me, I mean, you know, I wake up every day um, and I uh, consider myself extremely lucky, uh, truthfully, that, that I get to do what I do every day. I, I believe I'm at you know, at the right company at the right time, uh, doing all the right things. And, uh, and that just gives you so much energy, uh, and drive that, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, I couldn't be happier on that front. And on the personal front, I, we have, yeah. I have three children, they're 14, 12 and five. And, uh, yeah. And just trying to, uh, give them all the tools that they, that they need to be good stand up citizens and, 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 and fulfill their, their life goals and, and just do the best I can. I'm not saying I'm perfect by any means, but, uh, all we can do is give give it our best shot, and and uh, and hopefully uh, they pick it up. And uh, and but also on the personal front, I I have lots to be thankful for. Wow, man! Thank you so much for that. So you get, you said fourteen, twelve, and five for your children. Yes, sir. Two girls. All right. and a boy. That's a pretty. That's a good spread. Boy. Two girls and a boy. Okay, okay. So your your boy, your son, sounds like he's got to be a tough guy. If he's got two older sisters. Uh, no, well, actually, he's the middle. So he's the twelve year old. He's the middle. Uh, yeah, sorry. Okay. Yeah, he's in the middle. Um, and yeah, I mean, the five-year-old is a little firecracker, and 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 my daughter, the fourteen-year-old, is uh, is I think uh, more more like her dad than her dad even realizes. Uh, okay. And, uh, and our son is uh, uh, he's he's got a great heart, and uh, and he'll he'll find his way. And uh, yeah, it's you know, as a parent, it's just interesting to see how three children uh all end up being very very different and and i think that we should just recognize right. that there's no one path and uh diversity is the key to everything in both in 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 the personal but also in the professional world and um yeah and it, it's you know it's just very interesting to see uh these little adult little kids grow up into mini adults if you will yeah. and, and and see where they end up yep. and i'm excited to see where that goes well that's exciting thank you for sharing that so we also love to hear from from our heroes, Michael. What's a hobby that you have? What do you like doing for uh, for fun? Maybe to check out, just to just to relax. But any hobbies you like to share? Um, well, I I must admit that with three kids and and a fairly busy life, uh, I I, I right. probably am not the best to you know to uh, to 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 give people uh, advice on how to unplug. I find it very difficult to unplug. To be honest, it's also how I'm wired. I'm you know I I'm right. you know. It's, so, so, but the things that I love is I love speed. Uh, people that know me know that I love speed. Uh, so, you know, I've done NASCAR, I have done open wheel. Uh, I've, you know, I've done 200 miles an hour on a motorbike, uh, before we had kids though. So I just want to do the disclaimer there before people go like, <laughs> what an irresponsible parent. Um, but, uh, but I, I love speed. So that's one element that, uh, you know, I, it gives me, I love skiing. Uh, yeah. it gives a certain amount of adrenaline and, and I, so I'm a bit of maybe in a bit of an adrenaline junkie, but I also love just going for a walk. Uh, you know, we lived in Vancouver and, and now of course back in Europe, uh, you know, just go for walks, uh, with the kids, go to the beach if you can, or, you know, just unplug that way. I, I mostly spend my time outside of work with the kids and, and, uh, yeah. sometimes drive them around, but, uh, yeah, I, it, it's, 
it's not easy to find the right balance. I, I have to say that that's probably one of my life goals is to find better balance. Right. Well, I mean, I have to, I have to unpack one area you just said there. So when you said speed, I've never had a guest really say speed and talk to the different areas that you did specifically. So t- you mentioned NASCAR. So did you drive NASCAR? Did you, where, where, no, where were I, you doing it? Not, not profit, no, not, not, uh, not consecutively in races and stuff, but I, I went to the Charlotte Motor Speedway, uh, when I oh, lived yeah. in North Carolina. And so I've, I've driven there in the NASCAR and, uh, uh, I did 182 miles an hour, um, which was uh, at the day was the highest speed because the, the the lady that gave me the certificate looked at me. It's like, wow, you know, it's like, um, you know, so I, you know, I am very competitive as well, uh, as you probably guess. Uh, and, oh, yeah. um, you know, so when I was younger, I played soccer and I'm very, very competitive. I'm a very, let's just say, uh, poor loser. Um, <laughs> you get better over time. Yeah. But when I was younger and if I'd lose. Right. I wouldn't be very happy, uh, and uh, let's leave it with that. But um, no, I, I just love the, to try to always optimize. If I think if there's one thing that I, you know, if I kind of think about things, um, you know, I always want to capitalize and maximize uh, the potential. Um, so with right. soccer, I wasn't good enough to be a pro, but I certainly made up in effort what I didn't have in skill. Um, you know, because right. skill, skill without effort is meaningless, right? If you are highly talented, right. What I tell my kids all the time, yeah, if you're highly talented, uh, uh, but you, you know, put in half the effort, it doesn't mean anything. Yeah. You know, if you get the best, the waste, yeah. uh, you're just wasting. And I've said, I, I, that's the time where I get frustrated, honestly, is when I see people have the potential, but they don't capitalize right. on it. Um, and, right. um, you know, but you can't teach passion, right? I mean, it's, it's very challenging. I find it very hard to, uh, to teach people to get passionate about something, even if they have. The, the skill and the talent. Um, yeah. But again, skill and talent without uh, effort and, and, and energy uh, is just, just, yeah. just talent. It's nothing. It means nothing. That's right. That's right. Well, man, thank you so much for sharing about that stuff, Michael. So we're, we're getting here to the end of our interview. But the last two things I'd like to do, we'd like to do a lightning round, then we want to wrap up with the, with the why. But if we can, let's play that lightning round first. It's quick fire. You just fire back with what with answers that come to mind. Are you good with that? Sure, let's go. Let's give it a try. All right. All right. So uh, a man that has literally traveled the world and lived in so many different countries, I'm curious on this one. So what is your favorite food? Uh, oh, my goodness. Uh, Portuguese. Portuguese. Okay. All right. How about your favorite adult beverage? Uh, Pinot Grigio. Pinot Grigio. All right. Oh, no, no, no. What is uh, the... Uh, okay. Okay. What's uh what's an app on your phone that you can't live without? Email. Okay. Yeah, yep. I hear you. I hear you. How about the uh, all time favorite movie? Uh Godfather. Oh, nice. All right. Now what type of music do you enjoy? Uh Bob Marley. Oh, okay. That's the first Bob Marley we've ever had. All right. I hear you. What's a, give me a guilty pleasure. Do you have any guilty pleasures going on? Pizza. Okay. All right. And then the last question for you, Michael, you, you did a great, by, by the way, you're doing wonderful. Dogs or cats? Dogs. All right. You, you got I the answer. I'm allergic though. So we have a dog. We have a Labradoodle. Uh, okay. I'm, I'm allergic. I am too. So uh, I have a giant schnauzer and a Yorkie. So well, actually, my nice. wife has a Yorkie. I don't. I don't claim the Yorkie, but I definitely claim the giant <laughs> schnauzer. <laughs> yeah, I can. I, I I managed to only have one because you know that, that was a uh, the kids can the, the kids and the wife strong armed me into a dog. Let's leave it with that. <laughs> I hear you. I hear you. Well, great, great job with the lightning round. Michael, it's been a pleasure to get to know you. You've shared so much insight and wisdom on this episode. We call it Eco Ask Why. We always wrap up with the why. So for those listening, why should that procurement can constantly be acting to remain strategically important in that world of continuous disruption that you've been talking about? I, I think the world needs it. Um, I think for too long, uh, we have undermined the importance of procurement uh, and what we can bring to the table. Partially, it's because we were just unable to, as I said earlier, step up and, and, and lead and articulate why, we, why we're relevant. Uh, but I think the world needs it. If, if there's one thing that we need in the world, it's better business practices, uh, environmental, 
social governance. Uh, you know, th- th- there's so much out there today. Mm-hmm. Business continuity, risk, inflation, all these things that are out there today. And I think if there's one functional area that that is has is uniquely qualified and positioned to to support our our respective companies, I think it's procurement. So uh, you keep fighting the fight. Um, you know, it's it's not always easy. Uh, but if we are dedicated and passionate, then I'm, I'm confident that that we will continue to be strategic. That is wonderful. I love that so much. Now, where should the listeners go if they want to connect with you or Coupa to learn more? And you know, um, where are you most active? Just to just to like to give you a chance to give a shout out here. Yeah, you know, you can email me mvk at coupa dot com. Not going to be much easier than that. If you ever want to have a conversation okay. about whatever your companies are doing, or because I'm a constant learner, I think you have to be in procurement. So I always want to hear other people's perspectives. Uh, it, it helps inform me and uh, et cetera. And I think together, you know, like it's that none of us is as smart as all of us, as we say at Coupa. So I always welcome MVK at right. Coupa.com. Uh, I do enjoy uh, putting things out on LinkedIn. I always welcome people's perspectives and comments. So those are probably the two best ways to, to, uh, to, to get in touch. Okay. We'll make sure that all is synced up in the show notes for you listeners out there. And Michael, thank you so much for joining us today on Eco Ask Why. Yeah, thanks for having me. I really enjoyed this. Thank you so much. Yes, sir. Thank you. That was a really fun conversation with Michael. And I'll tell you what, I learned a whole lot about procurement, particularly around the areas of that continuous disruption that he's, he mentioned about. So just a couple of things that really popped out to me, that risk mitigation, the areas of risk mitigation that we could focus on, that we should be serving, and innovation. Because I think I really like how he broke down the innovation areas into t- tactical ways that you can actually move this forward. So tons of insight this will be one you need to go back listen to you know one or two times take a lot of notes particularly if you're in procurement because he he really broke it down that that four tier procurement that he broke down at the end if you're looking for the roadmap to procurement to really build out something special he gave it for you right there so if you're in 1.0 don't worry it's okay you can get to four but remember it's the journey this is not going to happen in six months this is just take he mentioned two to three years but it takes intentional actions and if you need help in procurement, guess what? Eco is here. We're here to serve. We can help you in these areas and, put, and get a lot of experts to help you along your journey to get there, to get you to that 4.0 that you want to be. So again, thank you for listening to Eco Ask Why. Be sure to check out Michael, all the wonderful things they're doing. Check out the show notes for all that. Give us a rating, write a review. That makes all the difference in the world. Share this out with someone, particularly if they're in procurement. Maybe you're in, in engineering right now at your plant. Share this with your procurement group. They, they would probably just, one, like to get something from engineering to actually let them know that, that you value procurement. So go ahead and send that email. You can tell them Chris sent you. That's fine. Get me in trouble. That's all good. But just share that stuff out. Thank you for listening. Go again to ecosy.com if you want to connect and learn more about our, our episodes or Eco Online to learn more about Eco directly. So thank you. Come back next week. And remember, keep asking why. Thank you for listening to Eco Ask Why. This show is supported ad-free by Electrical Equipment Company. Eco is redefining the expectations of an electrical distributor by placing people and ideas before products. Please subscribe and share with your colleagues and friends. Also, leave comments, feedback, and any new topics that you would like to hear. To learn more or to share your insights, visit ecosy.com. That's E-E-C-O-A-S-K-S. W-H-Y dot com.